Good morning, friends, and welcome back to NPTEL certification course on public speaking. Today, we are going to have a talk on the third lecture, and the lecture has been titled as Rhetoric in Public Speaking. My dear friends, most of us often think that once we start speaking orally, we think that our journey has started. No doubt, the journey had started, but then if you think that simply by speaking in public, you become a master of public speaking, I think you are in the wrong box. Needless to mention that in the previous lecture, we had referred to one quote by George Bernard Saw, where it was said that most of us are under the illusion that everything has taken place in communication. I mean, this is actually the gist of what Bernard so says. But then the way he says is, the biggest illusion in communication is that it has already taken place. My dear friends, all of us are also under the same impression that communication has taken place, but Communication does not become complete unless and until there is a feedback. Likewise, public speaking you cannot master simply by speaking in smaller groups or simply by introducing yourself. There are certain things that are required more than what many of us often think. Were you not the other day spellbound by a person addressing a mammoth gathering and then perhaps you might have realized that it was not only his speaking that made you spellbound, but there were other things also very important. And what were those other things? They were not only his grasp and command over words, not only the way he had started, not only the way he actually looked confident, but also there were some other ways also, the way he could win his crowd, the way he could win his spectators. So in this lecture today, we are actually going to talk about what are those ways? How can you persuade a person or a group of person to listen to your talk? Actually, in a technical way, this is called rhetoric. Now, many of you might be thinking, do we really require the use of rhetoric in order to make our talk become more effective, more influential? Of course, here is one very important line which Aristotle had said about rhetoric and that is, rhetoric may be defined as the faculty of observing in any given case the available means of persuasion. So, what is important is the means of persuasion. Now, most of you might be eager to know what are these means of persuasion and why only in the classical age or in the classical period when we had so many speakers and what they actually made us realize was not only rhetoric, but they also made us realize that apart from rhetoric, there were other things also important that also could help a speaker become a better speaker. Now, as I have mentioned that Aristotle believed in the art of persuasion and my dear friends, even today you will find that in several spheres of our life, in several, you know, not only in our everyday life, but in our uh, business activities as well, this art of persuasion plays a very vital role. I think most of you are aware of the fact uh, that when Aristotle actually gave a lot of emphasis on three words, and these three words have actually become so mandatory in order to make somebody an effective speaker 
and these three words are ethos, pathos and logos. Whether you are speaking or to a crowd or you are trying to sell something or you are trying to convince, you are trying or to sell an insurance policy or whatsoever or you are going to deliver a talk or a presentation or whatsoever, you need these three things and that is only when your audience members will listen to you. And how can we find and how can we give the example of these three terms? The very first term which is actually called ethos. This word ethos is related to ethics and this ethics is also related to a person who has got some credibility, a person who has got some stake in the society, a person who can be believed because you are not going to listen to a person in whom you do not have any belief. So, a person while applying ethos must ensure that he has got some amount of credibility. Now, let us look at uh, uh, one of uh, the lines which uh, I have uh, taken uh, from one of the speeches and here you can find how the person speaking, how he makes use of his ethos. He says that future is not one of ease or resting but of incessant striving so that we may fulfill the pledges we have so often taken and the one we shall take today. The service of India means the service of the millions who suffer. If a common person speaks like this, people won't believe. But when the first Prime Minister of India, Pandit Jahala Nehru had spoken in the very first speech after independence entitled Trist with Destiny, I think what he was using was the ethos. Next to that is the pathos. The word pathos is related to emotion. When you put your crowd in an emotional frame of mind so that whatever you speak can be heard. Say for example, here we can take one a very small example. For the price of a cup of coffee, you can feed a starving child. Now, here the speaker is trying to play upon the emotions of people and what he says is just for the price of a cup of coffee. So, whenever you want to drink a cup of coffee, naturally you start thinking about a starving child and you may perhaps stop fine having that cup of coffee because you believe that it can fulfill the needs of a starving child. So, here emotion has been taken into consideration. And the third is my dear friends and the most important because as I have been saying that it is not only that you speak, but you have to speak with conviction when you are speaking for public speaking, fine. So, what is expected is whatever you speak must have some logic, logos that is knowledge that is apparent, you know, apparent proof has, has to be there when you speak. Say for example, once again are the lines from the same speech by Nehru. This is no time for pity and destructive criticism, no time for ill will or blaming others. Now, here through his own knowledge, through his own observation, through his own apparent proof, he is actually trying his countrymen, he is addressing his countrymen and he is saying, we have to build the noble mansion of free India where all her children may dwell. Of course, when somebody speaks like this, where there is a logic, where the, there is an emotion, where there is actually a sort of ethical responsibility, people are bound to speak and that is what we mean by the use of rhetoric in speech. Now, here I am actually tempted to quote one of the lines from again Aristotle where he tries to differentiate how when a speaker speaks and what sort of device should he use so that he can induce his listeners, he can induce uh, the people to whom he is speaking. And there he says, there are three things. The first is sophistry. So, when somebody makes use of sophistry, sophistry consists in the moral purpose. If somebody uh, speaks something where he can impose morals, maybe people are not able to understand and maybe not able to realize. In dialectic, the dialectician has the power of faculty of making use of them when he pleases. When he does so deliberately, he is called a sophist. But here our concern is rhetoric. So, in rhetoric, 
apart from what I have said, what is important is the distinction does not exist. I mean a rhetorician uses sound arguments, apparent proof we have already seen as well as he who uses false ones are both known as rhetoricians. You also might have come across uh, several uh, court cases when uh, there is a hearing going on, you can find how in a very deliberate manner the advocate actually uses words and then he provides logic and then finally he waits for or he waits towards the eyes of the judge. My dear friends, all sorts of speakers, whether they are lawyers, advocates, sellers, speakers, preachers, all these people in some way or the other use logos, pathos and ethos. Now, you might also be eager to know what could have been the historical background behind this rhetoric, how it might have developed. You uh, would really be delighted to know that first it was developed. Uh, in an ancient age and most of the time the ancient Greeks, the Greek philosopher where we could find that there are plenty of examples namely of the Roman orators Cicero, Cicero who was actually a famous lawyer, a famous uh, philosopher and again uh, there was another person named Quintilian, we have just given a passing reference in the previous lecture. Now these two people added significantly to the study of rhetoric. Now what Cicero did, Cicero actually gave five you know canons, five canons as to how a person before speaking he could use those five canons in order to make his talk effective. Cicero actually tried to resolve the perpetual debate. There was a debate going on between the content and the delivery. Many people said it was only delivery that could have paved the way to becoming an effective speaker. But then Cicero says that content as well as delivery were very important and he said there has to be a sort of balance and what, what could balance? Style and the substance, harmony of the rhetorical perspective and the oratorial perspective and that is why Cicero became famous because of his five canons which he has already mentioned in the famous uh, book De Republica, fine and uh, there is another book on oratory, fine. So these two have become very popular. Another scholar named Quintilian, Quintilian, yes, Quintilian who also advocated that knowledge could be acquired through proper education and this Quintilian also belonged to Rome. But as times passed, things improved. In American Revolution, the rhetorical studies of ancient Greece and Rome were resurrected as speakers and teachers only looked to Cicero and others to inspire a defense of the new republic. Likewise, Quincy Adams of Harvard advocated for the democratic advancement of the art of rhetoric. But as uh, uh, times changed, in 20th century, rhetoric actually developed as a concentrated field of study with establishment of public speaking courses. And in many universities, many schools, many colleges, these public speaking courses became very popular. And here also, you know, when I am delivering a talk on public speaking or have developed a course in public speaking, that is also the result of what uh, many of us, many of you learners might be thinking of uh, to make use of it when they are exposed to speaking in public. Now, there were some later trends also and these later trends, you know, uh, after 18th century, meaning thereby in 19th and 20th and even in 21st century, there were many advocacies uh, for public speaking and especially on rhetoric. Francis Bacon, you all might have heard the name of Francis Bacon, an aphorist, uh, essayist and a, a great philosopher who said the duty of rhetoric is to apply reason to imagination simply by speaking when if you believe simply that uh, rhetoric was important, no, rhetoric was important of course, but the rhetoric had to be supported by reason, that is what Francis Bacon said, for the better moving of the will. And then there were certain uh, trends uh, in the later uh, age and these trends are epistemological, ballistic, 
elocutionist. Every talk that a person gives, before that talk, there are some other exercises to be done. And what are these? They are fine. The first is epistemological tradition. So, from episteme, epistemological tradition, which says that the knowledge of classical rhetoric and contemporary psychology are a must to create rhetoric based on human understanding. And it has actually to be audience centered. Why audience centered? Because whatever you are speaking, you are speaking for the benefit or for the advantage and the advancement of your audience members. So, we shall have a detailed discussion when we shall uh, discuss audience awareness and the role of audience awareness in public speaking. Next to that was uh, Bellis later movement, which was actually a departure from the rationalist and elocutionists. This believed in providing aesthetic qualities of writing over informative. All writing or all speech or all talk, all communication, all sorts of speaking was not simply based on information. Rather, it also should have some aesthetic qualities. Why are you still reminded of many of the speeches of great orators? That was That is because of the aesthetic quality, my dear friend. And the last movement that was there was elocutionary from elocution, elocutionary which focused on delivery and was widely publicized as and today you find in most of the on most of the occasions planned gestures when you speak not only what you speak but how you speak and are you able to make use of gestures postures are you also able to make use of voice can you make your voice raise? Can you make your voice come down? Can you ensure neutrality in your voices depending upon various situations? So, all these actually led to a uh, elocutionary movement. Of course, with times many of these uh, failed, but in a globalized world of today, when we are speaking and we are speaking even in order to inform people, you have to speak in such a manner that the people have to be won over and you make use of the persuasive techniques. In later 20th century, the National Communication Association, which was actually formed in the United States by a small group of public speaking teachers, they wanted to restore the rich qualities and scope that were once attributed to rhetoric, my dear friend. So, rhetoric plays a vital role in uh, public speaking. Now, you might also be thinking that are rhetorics only confined to the beauty of language? And if they are confined to the beauty of language, what are the other devices? How can you persuade people? Because in different fields, different tactics have to be used in order to persuade people. So, there can be, uh, we, here we have categorized it into three. The first is judicial rhetoric. You might have seen people speaking in court, especially the advocates, the lawyers. What they do? They not only speak, keeping into consideration the rhetoric aspect, but at the same time, they believe that facts are very important. Facts are very important. And even in terms of judgment about the past, fine, the lawyer brings the facts, but the fact is presented in such a manner that it is convincing my dear friend. Say, for example, when uh, the judge is witnessing to a uh, criminal case and you should look at the advocate how he presents that case. It is not that he will be devoid of logic, but he will actually present it in such a manner that the judge, now it totally depends upon the judge as to what sort of uh, judgment uh, he is going to provide. The next is the demonstrative rhetoric. Demonstrative rhetoric actually makes a sort of announcement about the situation, about the present situation, fine. Say for example, it may be an occasion for a wedding, it may be an occasion of a celebration, it may be an occasion of welcoming a guest, it may be an occasion uh, to celebrate something at a grand level. So, at that juncture, what you do is, you make use of this demonstrative persuasive technique. And the last is deliberative rhetoric. What is deliberative? It comes from the word deliberation, fine. It actually talks about the future. 
We have already discussed how when a political leader will deliver a talk, how he will show you the greener pastures, how he can make you aware of what, he, what are the impending challenges and the dangers and all, and he will provide you his own LEB. So these are all deliberative rhetoric. These are employed by politicians, by activists. Uh, in the past, many of these uh, orators have used this deliberative rhetoric by difference. Now, in all sorts of rhetoric, as I have been saying, the persuasion plays a vital role. And persuasion is a technique. How to persuade a person to listen to you? Because whatever wish, whatever ideas, whatever policies that you have, you actually want to make people realize the importance of it. And how is it possible? Of course, we have to use some amount of psychology in it. You actually have to play on the minds, on the psyche of the people. I think I might have referred in uh, Julius Caesar while Antony was to speak, how he actually played on the psychology of the mob and then how he also brought into the logos of the knowledge and then how he also made use of the delivery part and saying every now and then, Brutus is an honorable man, he says, Caesar was ambitious. So a public speaker's personality, as we have discussed earlier, credibility part, has actually an entitlement to persuade and determine audience's mood and motivation. That is why at times you will find when a speaker speaks, he takes into consideration the moods and the minds of the audience. And there are certain things that can win a speaker and a crowd can be won over when it comes to uh, the question of the speaker's reputation, what are the things that are taken into consideration? The very first thing is constitution. What do we mean by constitution? By constitution, we mean the appearance, fine, the personal appearance of the person. So, but sometimes these appearances may be deceptive as I will discuss later on. Then group membership, to which party, to which faith, to which committee, uh, to which rank does he belong? That is also very important. And then his role, what is his stature there? Fine. And then what is the situation? All these factors are very much important in order to win the psychology of the crowd. My dear friends, Raymond Ross, in his famous book, uh, Speech Communication, fine. So he provides us some persuasion filters and the barrier charts, which I have taken from his book. Here you can find that first is that you grab, you try to grab the attention and in order to grab the attention, you actually create a sort of need or you show them the need and then the topic objections and then the comprehension. So on the one side, you find that the message is there and while you are formulating the message, you actually take into consideration the role, situation, group membership and constitution. And finally, uh, because Nobody is going to listen to you unless and until you have got some reputation, my dear friend, and your reputation depends upon several factors which cannot be ignored. Now, are there some theories of persuasion also? Of course, if uh, uh, you go into the world of advertising, you will find there are several theories, but here uh, we will simply focus on some of them. Uh, and and uh, in this regard, I will once again go back to the five canons by Cicero, where Cicero says, invention, when you are going to formulate the message or create the message, you first do a lot of research, isn't it? You do a lot of research about the content. You also think about what are the needs of the audience. So this is the first step that is invention. The second is disposition or arrangement. You are going to arrange everything in a sequence. Imagine, because you know, when people do not get things in a systematic way, they are not going to believe in your words. So the way you arrange the entire speech that you have arranged, how you bring a sort of the crux of the message, and then comes the language, you know, the language is very important, fine. So this language can be considered to be style here in the words of uh, Cicero. So what sort of language? And this language is also depend upon the occasion, what sort of occasion it is. If it is an occasion of independence, naturally the mood will be different. If it is an occasion of sorrow, if it is a funeral speech, naturally the mood will be a bit somber. 
If it is uh, something else, then na naturally the mood will be different. So, your language depends upon the language with regards to the audience's accessibility and familiarity and then comes memory. I mean memory has given uh, too less a space because you know uh, on most of the occasions people's memory fail, is not it? So, less space has been given by Cicero to memory, but then uh, in today's world, of course, in today's world you have lots of things. For example, here I am delivering a talk, but then I am de delivering it with the help of the audio visuals and other uh, requirements. But in old days, days, think of it, people could not remember everything, but then there are certain tricks as to how you can have a sort of reliance on your memory all, only when you believe in a system. Why do you remember the names of the players in the order if you are a cricket lover? Fine, because it is in a system. First, this person will come. Second, this person will come. Like that, if you really want to rely on your own memory, please try to systematize your uh, content. And then is delivery. Of course, everyone's delivery is one's own. The way one plays upon words, the way one makes use of transitions, which we shall discuss when we go deeper and deeper in this course, Fine. And then, of course, your voice, which is your own property and the way you can make use of your voice, whether it is cracked, whether it is slurpy, whether it is high, whether it is low, all these depend upon you, my dear friend. Of course, there are certain theories of persuasion, namely the congruity theory. I mean, there is a sort of congruence, common agreement uh, between the audience's background and your speech or your talk. So, given the established differences between individuals, a public speaker actually acts as a mediator. No, you know the background of your audience and then you try to mediate. So, this is called congruity theory of persuasion. The other is balance, where you actually balance to reduce tension due to imbalance of ideas. If I am going to say something new, naturally many of them will resist there will be a resistance in their minds. So, as a speaker, one has to bring a sort of balance between motivation and action through speech. How can it be done? Ross says, either by modifying the affective or cognitive belief. Affective means emotion and cognitive is knowledge, my dear friends. But can all these uh, be used in a speech? It is very difficult, my dear friend, to use all these devices. But here, there are certain rhetorical devices that many of the speakers make use of and you should also try to make use of these devices in your speech or in your talk. So, that we call rhetorical device. Now, what is a rhetorical device? It is once again a ploy or a technique which the speaker uses to give a particular message to the audience in such a way, maybe it is a clever way uh, or sometimes you actually evoke a sort of emotional response so that they may understand. Actually, rhetorical device is a linguistic tool which can be employed to construct an argument or to make an existing one more compelling. In fact, uh, we run sort of time otherwise uh, we could have discussed a lot, but then I will make use of some of the rhetorical devices and show you how they can be used when you are giving a talk. So, first is alliteration, most of you are familiar with this word alliteration which is actually a Latin word, it is a device through which you are or a speaker is creating sounds of two or more words placed in any sentence. Look at the example and you will understand better. I have taken two examples both from Coleridge. Let us have a look at it. It is actually a sound which is kept very nearby in a sentence and most of these sounds are consonantal sounds. Five miles meandering with a meiji motion, meandering with a meiji motion. Look at these sounds, ma, ma, ma. Again, uh, uh, this is from Kubla Khan and another we can take uh, from Rhyme of the Ancient Manor by Coleridge where he says, and the balls like pulses beat uh, for the sky and the sea and the sea and the sky lay like a load on my weary eye. So, here you can see how the speaker or the poet or the writer makes use of alliteration. These devices actually captivate uh, the mood of the audience, the mind of the audience. There is uh, another rhetorical device called 
anadiplosis, anadiplosis, it is from a Greek word uh, and it means actually doubling and something that you double. There is a repetition of the last word or phrase at the beginning of the next phrase or sentence. Last word or phrase at the beginning of the next phrase in a sentence is repeated and then you can make use of anadiplosis. Fear leads to anger. See the last uh, uh, word in this clause is anger and again the uh, next uh, clause begins with the last. Anger leads to hate and again the last third one begins with hate and hate leads to suffering. It is from one very famous movie series uh, Star Wars where the main protagonists speak like this. Then we can also have an example from Dr. Johnson's where he says labor and care are rewarded with success. Again you see success and the next clause begins with success. Success produces confidence, confidence relaxes industry and negligence ruins the reputation. So this is how anadiplosis can be used in a talk or in a speech. The next is antistrophe which is actually the opposite of strophe. Uh, NT word itself means opposite, fine. So, counter turning, I mean uh, when you use it in a sentence, what you do is one phrase or one word can be repeated at the end of consecutive phrases. For example, uh, we can take one line from Ralph Waldo Emerson who says, what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny compared to what lies within us who would not be attracted to listen to such beautiful words. Again, there is another uh, line from Oscar Wilde, most of you are familiar with his name, who says, selfishness is not leaving as one wishes to live, it is asking others to live as one wishes to live. So, there are other devices also, antithesis, which is just the opposite of thesis. Uh, you can find here a graph has been made of thesis, antithesis and synthesis. In antithesis, what the speaker does is, the speaker simply juxtaposes in one sentence which are opposite and contrasting. You remember the famous lines, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for a country. The same has been reversed. Uh, even Francis Bacon says, crafty men contain studies, simple men admire them and wise men use them. Next is anaphora, in most of the speeches you will find anaphora. This anaphora is just the opposite of uh, uh, another device and in anaphora there is repetition and this repetition is only in the beginning of the sentence. We, we found there that it was in the end of the sentence, here we find it is in the beginning of the sentence. We have taken one line from uh, Nehru's speech. So, if we praise him, our words seem rather small and if we praise him, so in the beginning we have repeated. Then comes another that is diacopy where a word or phrase is split up by another word to display strong emotion. And uh, Martin Luther King again said, free at last, free at last, thank God you are free at last. Tolstoy says, happy families are all alike, every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. My dear friends, if somebody makes uses of such rhetorical devices, I think one will be able to win the crowd. Then there is ellipsis where, you know, the speaker by making use of ellipsis actually shows the time lapse. Four score and seven years ago our fathers brought forth and then ellipsis, so time lapse is shown through this. And then uh, lie to us where you will find that you speak two negatives but the meaning is positive. This is actually a sort of understatement where say, I mean from Hamlet let us take one line, he hath not failed to pester us with message. So the opposite of this is true because there are two uh, negatives used here. And then hyperbole, all of you are uh, familiar with, this is actually a sort of exaggeration. Uh, so for example, when somebody uh, in a very informal way also says, oh, I have not seen you for ages, my dear friend. I mean, this is just a sort of exaggeration or a, si a sort of hyperbole. Another sentence has also been taken from one poem. But my dear friends, when you know the use of all these literary devices, you will find that your speech, your talk, uh, your presentation becomes very effective. And uh, if, if uh, you have taken all these into consideration and could have understood something out of it, you will find how you can also make yourself 
uh, an effective uh, public speaker here before I come to the end of this talk. Uh, let me show you what could have been the power of rhetoric and this is from once again a very famous speech uh, uh, by Dr. Martin Luther King where it is said, I have a dream and every now and then uh, the speaker will repeat, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and leave out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day the red hills of Georgia, the son of former slaves and the son of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream today. So my dear friends, I do hope you too have a dream and your dreams can be fructified, can be fulfilled only when you make use of rhetorics in your speeches, in your talks, in your presentation. With this, I come to the end of uh, this talk. Thank you very much uh, for the patience.